Marsupials can be easily distinguished from all other mammals by the fact that they give birth to tiny, underdeveloped young that crawl from the birth canal and attach to one of their mother's teats in a state that would be considered embryonic for a placental mammal like us. In the world today, there are over 330 species of marsupial, but there are around 6,500 species of placental mammal, almost 20 times more. Why? Well, pretty much ever since natural historians first identified marsupials, to most, the answer had seemed obvious. Marsupials are more primitive, basically inferior to we more highly evolved placental types. Their primitive mode of reproduction in particular has restricted their diversity. I think this is largely, if not entirely, bullshit. And if you'd like to find out why I think so, keep watching. Hi, I'm Professor Steve Rowe. I'm a real paleontologist, and you're watching Real Paleontology. And today we're going to debunk the long-standing myth that marsupials are inherently primitive and inferior, and that their signature, allegedly half-baked reproductive strategy has massively constrained their ability to evolve into the vast diversity of shapes sizes and sheer number of species that proper, more sophisticated mammals like we placentals have achieved. The bottom line is, I reckon the reason why there are so few marsupials in the world today has little, if anything, to do with how they reproduce and a whole lot more to do with bad luck and a cruel twist of plate tectonic fate than bad genes. So before I explain myself further, first we have to define what is a marsupial even. The short answer is it's a species with a short gestation period, usually less than 40 days, and when born, they are usually no larger than a grain of rice. At this point, the tiny joey crawls to its mother's teat where it continues to grow. Most marsupials have a pouch, which can be forward-facing, as in the kangaroo, or rear-facing, as in the Tasmanian tiger but some have no pouch at all, like the North American opossum. The reproductive system is kind of unique. Most female marsupials have two uteri and two vaginas, while males often have a split penis, which sounds dreadfully painful. Now, all marsupials belong to one of these seven groups. However, marsupials are part of a bigger group, the metatherians. These include a bunch of extinct species, the best known of which are the Sporacinons. Among these are some big South American carnivores like the saber-toothed Thylacosmalus here, which I covered in an earlier episode. It's likely that these also had a reproductive mode similar to that of living marsupials, with very short gestation periods. Now, metatherians seem to have arisen at around the same time as placental mammals, back in the age of dinosaurs well over 100 million years ago. And by the end of dinosaur rule, metatherians were pretty widespread in Asia and North America. In fact, by the time the big rock hit our planet 65 million years ago, metatherians were actually more diverse than placentals in North America. But for reasons unknown, this catastrophic bolide event hit the metatherians particularly hard, and they recovered more slowly. However, this was not before they made it into South America, where they diversified into the Sporacidons and the ancestors of all living marsupials. Then from South America, they made a run for Antarctica and from Antarctica to Australia. Now, an interesting fact to bear in mind here is that early terrestrial placental mammals also made it into South America and Antarctica before the land connection between these two continents disappeared. And with the discovery of this little fella, Tingamara, back in 1992, it became clear that placentals also made it into Australia via Antarctica before the connection between these two continents also disappeared around 40 million years ago. So, in short, by 40 million years ago, South America, Antarctica and Australia were each isolated island continents, and all three had both placental and marsupial contingents on board for the ride. How did this work out for them? 
Well, interestingly, on the island South America, Metatherians dominated terrestrial carnivore niches, with saber-toothed species like Thylacus malus and Anaschlichtus, which I also covered in an earlier episode, as well as awesome bear-sized critters like Borhainae. Interestingly, though, placentals, such as this Liptotern and this giant ground sloth, dominated the terrestrial herbivore roles. Regarding Antarctica, the fossil record is pretty crappy, but at least five metatherian species have been identified, along with three placentals. And of course, in Australia, metatherians, including marsupials, diversified into hundreds of species, completely dominating all terrestrial niches, turning out everything from the apex predator Thylacaleo to gigantic mega herbivores like Diprotodon here. We even have the subterranean niche cupboard with the highly specialised marsupial mole. So, that's our little crash course in marsupial biogeography and deep history. There's a lot to unpack here, but before we do, I'd like to walk you through differences in diversity in terms of shape, skull shape in particular. Now, way back in 2007, I published this paper here with Nick Milne from the University of Western Australia. Convergence and remarkably consistent constraint in the evolution of carnivore skull shape. Here we included 28 species of placental carnivore and 13 species of marsupial carnivores. These included fossil as well as living species. What we did here is basically stick a bunch of what we call landmarks on each of the skulls in order to quantify similarities and differences between them in 3D space. What we found was that Despite the fact that our sample size for metatherians, including marsupials, of course, was relatively small, their diversity in terms of skull shape was very similar to that of placental mammals. In this later study here that we did with Angelica Swami from the UK, using a much bigger sample size, we came to the same conclusion. Obviously, these results contradict the proposition that the metatherian mode of reproduction somehow constrains their capacity to diversify, at least with respect to carnivores. Now, that said, there's still no doubt that if we include all species, there is obviously less diversity in shape among marsupials than placentals, as well as far fewer species overall. But again, is this really just attributable to limitations enforced by their reproductive mode. Of relevance here is a 2013 study by Marcelo Sanchez Villagra. He argued that these differences may have more to do with historic and geographic accident than anything else. Marcelo noted that after the monster mass extinction event that took out the dinosaurs, it took 20 million years before the first actual card-carrying marsupials evolved. In effect, this means that the radiation of living placentals had a 20 million year head start, and 20 million years is a lot. The early point here is that this end Cretaceous mass extinction event left metatherians almost entirely restricted to the southern continents of South America, Antarctica, and Australia. The combined landmass of these three continents is only 50 million square kilometres compared to a combined landmass of 110 million square kilometres for Europe, Asia, North America and Africa. And while the three southern continents became increasingly isolated islands, the northern continents were in large part connected to each other throughout most of the age of mammals, basically one giant connected landmass. Now, as myself and my friend Gabrielle Sansalone pointed out in this 2023 paper, there is good reason to expect greater diversity on one giant landmass than on a series of isolated landmasses, even if these isolated landmasses added up to the same area. For example, as I proposed in this paper on the rarity of big fierce carnivores, it's a fact that even if you dig down into the geological past, the diversity of large mammalian carnivores in Australia has always been less than in a comparable area in Africa. But when you crunch the numbers, this would be expected even if Australia had been dominated by placentals. Why? 
This is because in the event that a localised catastrophe wipes out all or most species on a continent that is connected to another continent, the affected landmass can be rapidly repopulated by species from any of the other connected landmasses. So it doesn't start from scratch. On the other hand, if the affected landmass is surrounded by ocean, this becomes much more difficult, if not impossible. This phenomenon can be observed even within continents. For example, the rainforests of the Congo in Africa harbour far less diversity than the rainforests of the Amazon. As observed by Mally et al. 2017 here, this is not because the African rainforests are less productive, it's because they have been repeatedly exposed to more severe periods of aridity, which not only greatly reduced the total area of rainforest, but it also busted this reduced area into isolated fragments of habitat. And this is before we try to account for the fact that Antarctica flipped into a total deep freeze around 34 million years ago that wiped out all terrestrial mammals, metatherian and placental, meaning that for the last 34 million years, metatherians have been almost entirely restricted to two island continents, amounting to less than a quarter of the area available to the northern land masses. Now, at this point, we need to get a bit more specific regarding the supposed limitations enforced by the marsupial way of life. It's often been argued that the reproductive biology of metatherians fundamentally excludes them from evolving into aquatic or flying species, and that this, in large part, explains their lack of diversity. Part of the argument here is that because the newborn marsupial needs to haul its way to one of its mother's teats, their capacity to evolve specialised limbs is greatly constrained. I think this is plain wrong. For starters, there is at least one marsupial that does have greatly modified limbs, the awesome little marsupial mole here, which is pretty much as heavily modified in this respect as any placental mole. Incidentally, there are now two recognised living species, and they represent extraordinary examples of convergent evolution when compared to the African golden mole here. I also point out that at least one marsupial has evolved to embrace a semi-aquatic lifestyle, the yapok or water opossum of Central and South America. What an intriguing little critter. To me, it seems to be convergent with Gollum out of Lord of the Rings. Anyway, it's clearly well adapted to life in the water. For example, as well as whopping big webbed feet, the female yapok has a rearward facing, totally waterproof pouch, and she has no problem keeping her young safe and secure while she goes fishing. There's no obvious reason why the yapok could not evolve into something as aquatic as a seal or sea lion. Flying might be more of a challenge, but many marsupials are proficient gliders, and there are ways in which flying could evolve. The most obvious would be through pair bonding, with the male taking up the responsibility of acquiring food until the young are sufficiently developed to be let alone. Pair bonding is rare among mammals in general, but it has been observed in at least one marsupial species, the rock-haunting possum of tropical Australia. To sum up here, I reckon the reason why there are so few marsupial species in the world today has a whole lot more to do with bad biogeographical luck than bad genes. An interesting thought experiment here is to try and imagine what would have happened if the bloody big rock that took out nearly all the metatherians 65 million years ago had landed somewhere else, leaving the few remaining placentals restricted to South America, Antarctica and Australia. I think that in this alternative history, where marsupials dominated the remaining post bolide landmasses, then in the world today, there would be way more marsupials and far fewer placentals. We might even be highly intelligent bipedal marsupials postulating that the sad lack of diversity among placentals was probably due to their inferior reproductive biology. A couple more points before I wrap this up. But before I do, if you've enjoyed this episode, please like and subscribe. 
it'll make my day. Firstly, it's a little known fact that placentals aren't the only mammals with a placenta. One group of marsupials, the bandicoots, went and independently invented themselves a placenta too. It's less well developed than that of placentals, but there's no reason why it could not evolve further. Lastly, as a parting shot to any remaining folks suffering with an irrational placental superiority complex, I'd like to draw your attention to this recent paper by Heather White and friends. In a study on the development of the skull, these authors found that placental mammals had not evolved much at all beyond that of the ancestral mammal, while development of the marsupial skull was way more evolved. Turns out that marsupials are more evolved than us. So, my fellow placentals, next time you see a marsupial, you might thank your lucky stars that the big dinosaur-smashing bolide landed when and where it did. And further, that through no fault of their own, marsupials drew the short straw in their choice of continents, winding up on three isolated land masses. If the chips had fallen the other way, I reckon it's very likely that we would be living in a world dominated by marsupials. There might even be some big-brained bipedal mammals with pouches arguing that the sad lack of diversity among placentals was a result of their inferior reproductive mode. <laughs>